This segment brought to you by Bravo Company USA. Uh, Drew Word, what are you? What are your opinion on pencil size barrels? Are they worth the reduction in weight? I, I think so. I, heavier barrels, remember, or they were mainly a volume of fire issue. If you look at the gun realistically, look at your carbine realistically and say, okay, how am I gonna use this thing in the real world? I'm not talking about taking it to the range in three gun matches or anything like that. I'm talking about how am I gonna use this firearm in the real world? Really, do you need a heavier barrel? Do you need you know, a medium or a heavier profile? So my call is, and it doesn't mean that we all, we both own range toys. It doesn't mean every you know AR I own has a pencil barrel by any stretch. Um, but what it means is the gun that I'm going to grab for the majority of my work and what the one I expect to, to trust my life to is going to have a lighter weight barrel. You just got to be realistic on the amount of ammo you're going to put through it, and um, and what you what you plan on it doing with it. Uh, to answer some of these questions, I mean now I run all aim points. Um, but again, to be fair, I, I was never a big fan of the old aim points. Uh, I just didn't think they had enough viewing area when the micro came out, completely changed my opinion. I've been aim point ever since. Another question I think that's, which one are you looking at? Uh, this one, this has been asked many times, so we should address it. Thoughts um, on 300 blackout? Yeah. Doug, Doug Thayer. Thoughts on 300 blackout. I'll give my two cents and then Larry can give his input. Um, you know, the 300 blackout, correct me if I'm wrong, Larry, but that was essentially uh, kind of a redesign of the 300 whisper. Am mm -hmm. I right? As far as I know, yes. Yeah, as far as I know. So it's been around for a while. It's kind of getting, you know, what's old is new again. Uh, that being said, you know, 556223 has been around how long? Oh, a long, <laughs> long time. And in a long, long time, you know, you just saw what the 77 grain come out and be kind of the new, new in, in AR platforms, uh, at least for the military. So my point that I'm making on 300 Blackout is this. Right now, it really is a caliber in its infancy. And I'm, I'm curious and excited to see what they do with it. But whatever they're doing now, I think it, you, the caliber shouldn't be judged on what they're doing now. It's gonna take some time just like the 556, 223 did to kind of go through some systems, go through some weight and some uh, different uh, you know, levels of powder and, and, uh, uh, and bullet weights before they kind of come up with the magic version or the best version for that caliber. Yeah, I, I would agree. I mean, it's not mature yet. Yeah. I think they're still, because you'll talk to people about what am you running? Well, you know, I got, I, I'm all over the map. You've got yeah. to, Subsonic and not, you know, yeah. you're all over the kind of the map. It, it I, works without a suppressor. It doesn't work. But it, yeah, I'm kind anything. of a wait and see guy on it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm really a logistics guy. I just had a, we did, we talked about it yesterday. At the end of the day, you got to feed this thing. And, you know, what's going to be your access and availability and cost to run in 300 blackout? So I'm, I'm kind of a logistics guy at the end of the day. I, that's why I generally stick with the bread and butter calibers. Here's an interesting one. Kind of mm. military, but it's interesting. You want to mention it? Mm. Or too, too specific? Yeah, let's hold off on that. Chen Lee, I love my EOTech. <laughs> Chen, we love you in there. Good old Chen. Yeah. It's like having that cousin, you know, that's not quite right. Yeah. Yeah. But he still shows up yeah, at all the family right. functions. You still got it, and it'd be nice yeah. to him and all that. Wear his shirts and stuff like that. Um... All right, here, what do we got here? Uh, I, this is kind of an interesting. Matt Kidwell, AR-15 15 compensators. compensators. Um, at this point, and again, Larry was mentioning uh, kind of in the, we were talking about the nylon or gear space earlier, post 9-11. Um, and again, we all know this, that are talking on here, but the post 9-11 firearms and firearms accessory space, absolutely no different. You've seen an explosion. I mean, it's yeah. amazing how many options there are now. Absolutely. And again, if you're going to pick a compensator or if you're going to judge a compensator at the end of the day, it's what I, what I tell people is there is no official rating of 
this gun compensates this amount of recoil and brings the barrel down. That there is nothing like that. So at the end of the day, take a couple, buy a couple compensators, and see which one runs the best for you. Well, and you got to see is it and what are you using it for? Yeah, are you going to put? Is do you need it to put a suppressor on? Is it a range it? toy or what? Are you gonna, is it self, if it's something you you anticipate using for self defense and buddy, you had better get it in close you know close quarters. You better get it in low light and see if the muzzle blast and if the, the muzzle flash is going to be an issue for you. Because if it is, you might want to be thinking in a different direction. So, hey, if it's a range toy, then drive on. But if, it, if it's something you're going to use for serious use, you need to take a real hard look at it. Um, I've been using the Bravo Company gunfighter, you know, compensator, for lack of a better term, tactical compensator, whatever. And it's kind of a blend of a flash suppressor and compensator, and it works pretty good. Um, it, it's not a bad combination device if that's the kind of thing you're looking for. If you want it pure self-defense, it's hard to beat a flash suppressor. I can tell you that right now. Your muzzle blast is going to be minimized, and of course the muzzle flash is going to be largely eliminated. So just, you, once again, it goes back to, I don't, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but you, what are you using it for? You know, is it something that you're going to use for self-defense, or is it a range toy? Um... See right here. Bet Antonio Lopez, best rifle mags to stock up on metal or polymer. I tell everybody, you know, metal, the aluminum USGI magazines, those are the ones you stockpile, you know, for, you know, one of those deals you're cleaning out, cleaning out your closet 10, 15 years ago. Oh man, I forgot about these. Those are the ones you stockpile, use the polymer ones today. <clears throat> Generally, there's really good polymer magazines oh. on the market now. There's, there's a lot of really good ones. Yeah, a lot of them. And um, but I would I wouldn't stockpile the polymers. Those are the ones in my mind. I I shoot today. You know, I'm going to the range with them. I'm practicing with them. And then you take those aluminum USGI mags and put them away because hey, there's aluminum USGI magazines from Vietnam that are still serviceable. Um, so by all means, now there's plenty that are worn out, need to be trashed. But if you take a mint. USGI magazine from Vietnam, I guarantee it will still work like a champ. So those are the one you stockpile metal, USGI metal, you know, and then for AR mags it is, and then you polymer mags are the ones you use today. Um, I'm going to address this one because this again goes to what the gray man's about. Uh, Matt Poy Poyenter. Uh, thoughts on a suppressed carbine for home defense or civilian use. Um, one of the things I'm going to be talking about on Gray Man is um, a bunch of different things, but home defense will be addressed. And th there's so many arguments that you could make. Um, and again, a lot of the things that, that you know Larry talks about or I talk about, and especially that I'll talk about on Gray Man, is um, there are a lot of different ways to accomplish the same thing. And, you know, there's a million techniques and a million tactics because there's so many different ways to do it. And what's more right or less right, that, that doesn't really matter. Talking about uh, using a suppressor, let's say, for home defense, let's just throw out some interesting options. Um, okay, let's say you have a suppressor. Well, now maybe you are able to, if you actually had to do an engagement in the house, now you're not going to freak out. Your kids sleeping in the room, you're not going to freak out your family, you're not going to freak out the neighbors. That being said, if you didn't have a suppressor, you know, maybe you missed the first round and that sends, you know, the assailant running out, which, look, at the end of the day, you're going to want someone to leave your house rather than getting freaking your carpet stained. That's just reality. Anyone who says, oh, no, I want to smoke a dude in my house. No, you don't. Mm -hmm. Honestly, no, you don't. And if you do you better have CCW safe. Unless you live in Texas, then you're good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but point being is there's a lot of different things that, you know, there, there's there's advantages and different uh, disadvantages in so many different ways. And on Gray Man is where I'm going to address all the different variations and possibilities and the advantages and disadvantages of each. Cool. What do you got, Ray? I was trying to find it. There was somebody back here that asked about, I want to mention him by name, um, if you only have 100 rounds of, of practice ammo every few weeks. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, I did that's see that. that. Pistol, carbine. Pistol. Pistol always needs to be your foundation. 
pure combat marksmanship training based on the fact that we live in a world of CCW. And, you know, law enforcement carries a duty handgun all the time. So you're, not that you would never use a carbine, but your likelihood of using a handgun is much higher. And, and it's also the most difficult hand, firearm to master. So it needs to be your foundation. And in addition to all that, it perishes. It's the skill that perishes the quickest. Yes. So when I go to the range, I'd say eight, nine times out of 10, I'm practicing pistol. And it's weird. And I know you're the same way, Larry. You can not shoot a carbine for four months, pick it up. It still, still hit damn near the same times as you did if you were yeah. shooting every day. So Pistols, yeah. Put a lot of work into pistol. And, and again, like Larry said, I mean, at the end of the day, especially in a uh, law enforcement or civilian capacity, um, the pistol is what you're going to be using. Lawrence Wu, what's your rationale in stocking up on USG mag and using polymer? Uh, shouldn't you just use USGI and not bother with polymer? That's your call if you just want to use USGI aluminum mags. There's nothing wrong with that. Okay. Um, this, the question was, you know, do you stockpile polymer? And I'm, my belief is if you're going to be a guy who runs polymer mags, you want to run them now. Um, I wouldn't plan on them being you know, fantastic. Because polymer, let's face it, plastic deteriorates over time. And uh, I wouldn't, my call is safe bet stockpiling metal and using the polymer ones now, which work great. There's a lot of good polymer yeah. mags in the market like we talked about. Yeah, I, I was kind of a HK steel mag uh, snob for a while, and then I started using the uh, started using the P mags kind of on a. I, I was given a couple, and at this point, I have shot the crap out of those mags, and and they work, and they work great. Jeff Lowry, any plans to have Fuck Long join you guys in the next FB Live? If I can get Fuck Long on board, I will be more than happy to do a. You know, LAV live with him by all means. Uh, we had a great time doing that video at shot. I'm going to be more than happy to have him on board. So if I can pull it off, trust me, I will. Here, here's a good one. That's kind of what we're talking about with uh, the increase in uh, mm. weight on that. Yeah, I don't know. Do you see the industry? Do you have some thoughts? Um. Yeah, I mean... At, at the end of the so AJ Warren asked, "Do you see the industry expanding on CCW CHL defense training past the basic firearms handling courses?" I'll give you my personal answer on that. They better. And what I mean by that is, again, going back to what I said earlier, if you if you carry a gun in a concealed carry capacity, you have to have the expectation. That by it being on you, if something happens, um, you know, to protect yourself or, you know, immediate lives that are in danger, then you are, you know, if you're carrying it, you have to have the expectation that you might use it. And if you have the expectation that you might use it, you better have the training mm -hmm. that leads to the confidence, but more importantly, the skill to get involved in the situation and affect it safely and in a positive way. No one wants any, no, no one carrying a gun should not have enough training to be able to, uh, you shouldn't draw your gun and make the situation worse. It's that simple. And then that takes a lot of training, not just marksmanship, but scenario based training to understand, um, all the different factors that go into not just shooting on the range, uh, but a gunfight. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Hey, Adam Robert Robertson, classes in the Charlotte area. Yeah, I've got a October 1st pistol class here at an indoor range, point blank range, here in Matthews. We've got an October 1st pistol class. It's the first class in the Charlotte area I'm going to be doing. Charlotte, North Carolina. So check it out. <clears throat> uh, do you have any thoughts on this one? Ian Fu, thoughts or tips on ready pistol storage practices for home defense, quick access, safe, specific types, best practices, what to avoid. Um, I've always been a fan that if you want to have the gun fully loaded, ready to go, it's on your body. If it's, a, if it's off of your body, it needs to be as a general rule, condition three, if that's where you're getting at uh, question-wise. 
So empty chamber, hammer down empty chamber, or striker down empty chamber, and loaded mag. So you can pick the gun up, rack the slide, and engage if it's off your body. Of course, you have to make sure it's stored safely away from children. So, you know, because remember kids, one thing I've learned about my son, they're always farther down the road and much more mature than you think. So, I mean, don't think that they can't pick up that gun and, and charge around in it and, and make it discharge. You, you don't assume that. So you have to make sure the gun's safe. Yeah. And again, kind of going back to what I've said before, uh, this is, this is questions like these will be covered uh, on the gray man talking about home defense. We'll talk about, uh, different, uh, I'll, I'll pull out different safes, pull out different options. Again, with the in-state always in mind, do you have kids? Do you live alone? Do you sleep, you know, do you, are you married? Do you sleep with someone in the same bed? If so, there's so many factors that go into all these different scenario-based questions that you really have to understand what the scenario is to be able to answer what the best tactic, technique is, or technique is to apply in that specific scenario. Yeah. Mo Rees, thoughts on Springfield Custom Shop make, taking any jobs to 2017? I didn't know that, and I'm sure my book on the 1911 did not help that because I talked to my buddy Dave Williams at SHOT Show <clears throat> if they've gotten requests for guns you know, in the, that are in the book. He said, oh my God, yes. So I'm thinking my book might have, I mean, certainly made that worse, obviously. I've seen two things that are coming up a lot. Uh, a lot of people have asked suppressor questions mm -hmm. and a lot of pe uh, this guy's or several people have asked questions on uh, opinions on the future of firearms. Larry and I actually today, or maybe it was yesterday, we're actually talking about the future of firearms. Got any thoughts on that, Larry? Mm. I'll, I'll give my two cents. Material. What do you think? My two cents of, of this, and I, I think I did say it today, and that is the pace of technology is increasing. I mean, look at look at what we're doing right now. I mean, this is this is technology yeah. right now that is just brand new, and we're we're kind of learning it as we go. Um, but if you look at firearms, I mean, we're all, we're at the end of the day shooting. You know, we take ARs to the range, and we're shooting guns that are how many years old? If you shoot a 1911, how old is that gun? So, where I'm going with this is the future of firearms, to a degree, I believe, needs to somewhat more incorporate technology. You're seeing, um, and actually let me back up, where I see the future of firearms is right now you're seeing kind of the Lego brick approach, which is just like uh, with helmets. You got a helmet, then you you need to attach a nod to it. Sorry, my bad. Helmet, attach a nod to it. So now you got to put a nods mount on it and then you got to put a battery pack on it. It was never meant to do that all together. Okay, the helmet's been around for literally thousands of years. Firearms are kind of the same way, where we're taking something that was designed for this purpose, well now we need a laser, now we need a flashlight, now we need all these different things. I believe the future of firearms isn't seeing firearms as just a weapon system, but seeing it as an overall tactical system. And having things that are incorporated, and by incorporating them into the eventual design, now you streamline, make it more ergodynamic, more sleek, lighter weight, all those different things. That's where I think the future of firearms, A, needs to go, and B, will go. Yeah, and you, you know, there's a, a um, firearms blog had a post here recently on Colt Canada doing a project with the Marine Corps along these lines, looking at integrating systems more and it I'm all for that I think it makes a lot of sense the thing you got to have it though it has to be a platform it has to be adaptable to future developments in technology that's one area why monolithic uppers on ARs has never really went anywhere because if you look at hand guards just think about it just five years ago Picatinny rail handguards were the norm. There was all kinds of them on the market. Now you can't hardly give them away just five years later because you've got, you've got Keymod, which I use on my Bravo company. Same. You've got MLock. You've got a variety of others out on the market. Um, and it, now everybody's completely moved away from it. And then if you have a monolithic upper, it kind of locks you into that point in time. So 
It has to be something that's adaptable and modular and it has to be, you have to have the ability to adapt it to upcoming technology and where it, it integrates seamlessly. Easier said than done, by the way. Absolutely. And actually, I didn't give credit. That came from Preston Moteberg, FYI. Cool. Yeah, here's an interesting one. Oh, biggest failure you repeatedly see. Yeah, Jeff Lowry, what's the biggest failure you repeatedly see in your classes? Um, usually, I mean, guys running guns too dry. I still see that. It's so common as the day comes out. For whatever reason, people don't understand the concept of lubing their guns. Um, that, I mean, that has to be it. Honestly, if I had to point to one thing, you'll see other stuff pop up, that, but a lot of the other stuff is kind of learning curve related. Lubing the gun is almost a universal issue. It's something that somebody, I guess the human brain doesn't function. It doesn't, the concept, I guess they don't see the oil in the engine compartment or the transmission of the car they drove to the range. It doesn't, you know, and they don't have to put the oil in on a regular basis. I don't know, but for whatever reason, Running guns too dry is still the number one problem I've seen. When I started 10 years and 5,000 students ago, I saw it then. And now, 10 years and 5,000 students later, I see it now. Um, I'm going to pull up one that actually two people asked in, in close proximity to each other. Aaron or Eric McMillan asked uh, thoughts on importance of mag capacity in a CCW handgun. And then a little lower down... Uh, Mac Freeman asked thoughts on extra mag for CCW carry. Um, I'll, I'll give you my quick thoughts. One, mag capacity, um, that's kind of a hard one to give because there are some states that you can't go over 10 rounds. Personally, Larry and I already said uh, Glock 19, which, you know, I, I've got a plus two on my 19 depending on how slim I'm running, but so I'm going with pretty much 17 plus one in the chamber on my, on my person. That being said, even with that many rounds in the gun, I will never carry a CCW ever again without an extra mag on me. Yeah. And the realization, and the reason is very simple. Again, you have to carry, if you carry a gun, you have to carry with the expectation of the possibility of using it. With that in mind, imagine actually doing an engagement. Now think back to every shooting scenario you've ever heard of what are their initial reports say multi and it's usually one person but the initial reports are always two we're thinking two three shooters two three shooters the reason is is because when you get shot at from an unknown distance and where you know can tell you this you immediately think it's coming from several different directions and what that leads to is the perception that there's multiple shooters now imagine, let's say you get the drop on one, you engage them, and let's say you miss a couple, let's say you hit a couple. At the end of the day, if you don't have that extra mag on you, if there is more than one person, you're, really you, you're, you're out of luck. And even if there is only one person, again, if there's one thing that you want to go into a gunfight with, or any fight with for that matter, it's confidence. Mm -hmm. And that extra mag... It's just that little bit of confidence that, you know what, if I go dry here, if I miss a couple rounds, if they run for cover, or if somebody else comes online that's helping them, I still have another mag that I can get behind cover, do a reload, and still go to work. Yep. Hey, I see my buddy Jamie Wiedemann shouted out here. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Um, as far as suppressors, I've, I've used a lot of Surefire products. That's kind of my go-to brand. I hear good stuff about Silencer Co. I've heard good things about them and as a company and their products. But what suppressors do I use the most when I do use suppressors? It's, it's Surefire. Same, same for me. I've been running Surefires um, for a bit now. Um, I have bought a couple other different ones to try out uh, uh, different types of suppressors, uh, different types of suppressors. One that you need to check out, if you haven't checked out, it's pretty sweet. Um, again, I have nothing to do with the company other than uh, I bought their suppressors and thought they were pretty cool. Check out the Thompson Machine Poseidon suppressor. It's pretty sweet. Hey, uh, let's see here, Christian Haynes, more weight on piston gun. Uh, no, it's, uh, Rob Cates, gas versus piston. 
was pissing really by you. Um, I knew a little bit about this subject matter, I think. <laughs> I think maybe. Um, I'm being a smart ass. My theory on the piston is real simple. You have to ask yourself four questions. Okay. Do I have the need to run the gun with a barrel length shorter than 14 and a half inches? Do I need to use the gun suppressed? Do I need to use a lot of full auto? And do I need to use a wide variety of ammunition? If your answer is yes to any of those questions, you probably should take a look at a piston gun. That's not absolute. I've seen, I've got a 12 and a half inch BCM gun, um, a short barrel rifle, and it runs like a champ. So you've seen some advancements, but I can tell you, every inch you get shorter than 14 and a half inches, um, you're gonna you're getting down into piston territory. Um, certainly, full auto keeps the bolt carrier you know cooler. So those are the four questions you asked. Do I have to run the gun with a shorter barrel than 14 and a half inches? Is that a requirement? Number two, full auto. Number three, suppressed use. Number four, a wide variety of ammo because there are distinct advantages to piston guns in those four categories. And for most people, the answer is no to all four of those, or maybe a you know, a maybe, and you can get by with a DI gun by all means. A DI gun runs like a champ. Just keep the thing lubed and you can have at it. Uh, I'm gonna answer this one because I think this oh shit, what am I doing? Uh, oh, so John Lambert. Asked, how do you feel about less lethal options? Uh, for instance, OC baton uh, doesn't specify too much to accompany your concealed carry weapon. Um, that's that's actually a great question. Something again that I'm going to cover in depth on the Gray Man. I'll just give uh, kind of a couple sentences on it. But it goes back to you know the the presenting sponsor of Gray Man CCW Safe. You know, at the end of the day, if you look at um, police use of force, which is going to have a very similar um, kind of uh, court um, precedent set for civilians, you know, if you hit somebody with OC spray or you tried to hit them with the baton or you did hit them with the baton and they keep coming at you and then you draw and resort, resort to deadly force, that's going to come up in court and it's going to come up in court that you tried. So I do think that is, uh, you know, it is a viable option. And at the end of the day, again, shooting should always be a last resort. And so carrying those non-lethal options not only give you a non-lethal option, but they also, in case you do use a lethal option, they give you the ability to um, have used a use of force continuum. And then a... No, that's a great. This is a great question for the CCW Safe guys. Absolutely, something to ask you, them you know, get Membership. Hit them with an email. Hey guys, what's your opinion on this? There's sharp guys. I told you, there's some of the sharpest guys I've ever met in the firearms industry. They're good. Not only do we like them, and they're good guys. We consider them friends. But they are razor sharp. They know what they're doing. Trust yeah. me. But especially on the, on the legal side, I mean, they're that's man. They're what they do. They're on it like blue bonnet, baby. I'm telling you. Um, what we got this here? one would be an interesting one for you. Oh, nickel, nickel boron, uh, Travis deal, nickel boron coated bolt carrier groups easier to clean than a standard bolt carrier. Yeah. And they generally are. And I'll tell you where I've seen them. I've, I've used a couple. They run you know, inevitably. If you're, if you're a guy that's good about lubing your bolt carrier, I don't, you probably don't need one, but if you're the average guy and you don't lube it like you should, there's some merit in nickel boron. Well, I, think, I think there is. We, we got to address this one. Ian Fu. Uh, Ian, where can, Ian Fu. Uh, yep. Ian. Ian Fu. Where can we... Yep, go ahead. Where can we find out more about the Gray Man? Uh, where will it be watchable and when? Um, I'll defer to Larry. I think you know more of the timeline. I don't know. Do you know? I'm going to defer to myself. Um, <laughs> the... Uh, it's, it's something, again, we wanted to talk about it. It's something that we've, we've been working on for a long time. Um, again, it's one of those things that we don't want to roll up. We have some great content, and I think some things, a, a lot of the things we address are a lot of, um, a lot of the, the scenario-based stuff will be addressed on Gray Man. Again, a lot of the weapon-specific stuff that couldn't be more in Larry's wheelhouse 
But when you take the weapon and integrate it with a scenario, that's what we're going to get uh, more into the Gray Man. The other part of the Gray Man name comes down to this. Uh, scenarios are gray. They're not black and white. A civilian shooting, a law enforcement shooting, they're not black and white. Hell, even military engagements are never, uh, or at least in today's battlefield, not as black and white as they were back in the days when enemies wore a uniform um, and followed, you know, Geneva Convention, things like that. So um, it's going to be coming out soon. We're going to have the website up soon. Um, it will be watchable on your page. Hold tight on all we'll, that. Yeah, we're we'll, still in we'll development. We, we will be releasing that. And, and trust me, if you follow my Facebook page, you're going to be well aware of what's going on. We're not going to leave you in the dark. We'll, we'll probably end up doing a live announcement of exactly yeah, what we're aware. Don't sweat it. You'll be well aware of what's going on. Uh, I had one right here, a real good one, actually. Cole Willett. Got to ask one more time. Think we'll get Russian imports in this lifetime? Siega's supply is dwindling, and Mosins are getting expensive now. Here's my call. I think it's real simple. If Donald Trump is voted president, I would say, yeah, we will see Russian firearm and firearms imports back into the United States. If if he doesn't and it's Hillary, you're, I think we're done. I don't think you'll ever see him again. I think we're done. So it really boils down to the presidential elect election. Trump, yes. Hillary, no. Um, <laughs> I, I'm going to answer one for Larry. Wesley Rainey, are shotguns still relevant? <laughs> Larry's not a big shotgun fan. Um, you know, again, relevance, uh, relevant is a relative term. So again, what do you want to do with it? The only personally where I've seen shotguns relevant is again in a law enforcement compa capacity where they can essentially toggle between different types of rounds for specific scenarios using, you know, non-lethal, um, you know, CS rounds or beanbag rounds, things like that. Um, law enforcement has a niche that, that really a shotgun can be used for in a lot of other ways. Um, you know, there's a lot of systems doing it better now. That's my personal opinion. Yeah, they, once again, like you said, I'm not a big shotgun guy at all. Um, it just boils down to what are you gonna use it for? It, it, it has a niche role. It, it, there, there's times when you need the specific application that different uh, shotgun rounds bring to the table, whether it be a breaching round, CS round, whatever, and that's where they come in. Man, for self-defense, nah, dude. I mean, just think about think about how long, if you have to reload that thing, I mean, they'll have to time you with the sundial to reload <laughs> that. I mean, no. So my call, very limited application in this day and age. Uh, here, Not that they're useless, but they're it's limited. Yeah, yeah. it's it's decreasing. Uh, J. A. Chrysostom. Does I know I butchered your name. I apologize. Um, but he asked, "Does a bullet drop compensator or BDC reticle work for high angle shooting?" The answer is sort of. So the. BDC is essentially calculating the, dr the, the drop. The drop is going to be the same regardless of the angle. So the BDC will work for whatever angle you happen to be at. That being said, there's a separate calculation that you'll have to do, which is what is the angle you're at. Then you're going to have to figure out what the angle is. Once you figure out what the angle is, there are tables on, um, on compensating for your degree of angle. Once you figure that out, then you'll be able to somehow integrate that with the BDC and make your appropriate hold off. So the BDC is still ca calculating the proper drop, but the angle is adding additional um, it's actually removing drop. So you're going to have to figure out that, uh, you're going to have to figure out, the, out that equation and adjust accordingly. So you just have two things to figure out now instead of one. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple here, Mo Rees, Larry, I shoot IDPA and USPSA mini matches. Is Larry Vickers one day advanced pistol for me? Yes. If you're 
a competent shooter and you want to be challenged, the one day advanced pistol is right up your alley. Hey, uh, another one, Daniel Sinclair, how are you handling the transition from Alias? It's going real well. Uh, my shout out immediately on social media that I'm going to honor all my commitments to, to Alias over to Aztec Training Services went real well. I mean, it was a big hit. And we're just sorting through all the details of that. Um, we're trying to get people to get their credit card refunds and whatnot where it's applicable. Regardless, I'm going to cover them. If it turns out, hey, my credit card won't give me my money back, you're good. No worries. Um, it's just doing, it's the right thing to do. Um, so I see a couple people putting best, the best place is this, the best place is that. Again, be very careful about when you use the term best. Everyone shoots differently. Everyone has different body types, different eyesights, different ultimate usage, uh, usages. And even within the same usage, each situation is going to be completely different. So stop really trying to look for the best and look for something that just works because best is only going to be known in the hindsight of how the situation actually occurred. I get, I get people asking about fire clean. Um, I tell you, my experience with fire clean on suppressed and fully automatic weapons, guns that you run hard, it's the best stuff I've ever seen. It holds up to heat and it does allow, I mean, cleaning the guns you know, is dramatically easier. I mean, that stuff, if that's in your wheelhouse, you need to check it out. On handguns, I've had that stuff thicken up on me repeatedly, and I don't know why. So I honestly, I don't use it on handguns anymore, but boy, I would not be afraid to use it on suppressed guns, um, you know, belt feds, guns that you're going to run hard. That it stuff works real well for that. Um, I'd like to answer, probably not a lot of people know what this is, but Drew, Drew Word um, asked, y'all's opinion for AR weapon lights, opinion on Surefire's IntelliBeam. Um, have you used the IntelliBeam? Mm -hmm. So the IntelliBeam um, is actually pretty, pretty cool. Um, I, I've, I've done several things with Surefire. The IntelliBeam essentially, and I'm giving you the most, uh, an engineer would probably get really upset at me, but the layperson of what it does is it adjusts the, it automatically adjusts the power of the flashlight based on the distance that the flashlight is being pointed. Pretty interesting, right? Mm -hmm. um, I used it very briefly. I got kind of like a prototype version and messed with it. I thought it was super cool, super interesting, and thought it had a lot of potential. Again, I don't think it's, I don't think it's been released officially yet. Um, but the technology that Surefire has with the IntelliBeam, very promising. And I think you'll be seeing a lot more of that type of technology in the future. Cool. Tim Oreck, the new breed of pistol caliber SBRs like the CZ Evo Scorpion, new MP5, SIG MPX, range toys, or niche defensive weapons. Um, certainly a range toy. I mean, everybody loves to go out and shoot stuff like that, particularly MP5. I mean, let's face it. Um, so yeah. the, the semi-automatic MP5 variants have been fun to shoot since day one. I would look at them now. Maybe it's a, a weapon that you would choose over a, an AR for a home defense weapon because it is shorter, a little bit more, you know, easier to manage per se. Let's say in an SBR format. Um, maybe it's a weapon that your teenage son's going to run or your wife. And... Um, it, you just they have more confidence with it versus a five five six carbine. So in that realm, it'd be kind of it'd be a niche defensive tool. Um, it's something that you know I can't envision a situation where I can you know I can I can I can have a pistol caliber carbine or short barrel rifle, but I can't have a five five six short barrel rifle. There might be some you know with the gun laws we have in this country, who knows? There could be some place where that doesn't fly, but you know, you may have family members that can just run a pistol caliber SBR better than a than a rifle caliber one. That's kind of where I see it. Um, we got a whole platoon watching. John Flores is watching with a whole platoon. <laughs> 
Well, what do you, what do you guys but got? I, What's awesome advice? This platoon appreciates it more than you yeah, know. Yeah, if you're watching cool. with the whole platoon, send send us a question from the platoon. Oh, oh, wait, 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 here we go, here we go. John Flores, so this is, a, I assume, the platoon question. Any opinion on using drop leg versus chest mount side holsters for uh, for being dismount? Um, this is actually a good question. Um, I've never been a drop leg guy, and the reason is, is there is actually a formula um, but anything that you put on your leg, I don't care the greatest leg mounted holster in the history of leg mounted holsters, it sucks. No offense to any of the manufacturers, but putting a holster on your thigh, as soon as you start running or moving at speed, that gun is gonna move its angle, which is gonna move where it is when you go to draw it. That's just a fact of life. Um, I personally, if I was doing a dismount from a vehicle, um, I had a mount that I could switch from my hip to my chest. Um, there's several systems out there right now. I don't really like running a pistol on the chest, except when I am um, in a vehicle specifically needing to possibly draw from dismount. That's personal preference, but just know anytime you mount a pistol on a leg rig, it is gonna move like crazy. And Larry, I know knows that from experience as well. Cool. And you guys are with 118th Infantry and First ID. Like, was that Georgia? Cool. You guys in Georgia? Cool. First ID. Cool. Excellent. Thanks, guys. Hey, question from Jonathan Thomas. Why, why 28 rounds instead of 30? I'll tell you why I teach that. It, it is difficult for the average AR shooter to consistently seat a magazine that's fully loaded to 30 rounds with the bolt forward. Every single carbine class I have, beyond a shadow of a doubt, there will be somebody in the class, and usually more than one person, that has difficulty seating that magazine with the bolt forward with 30 rounds in it. My buddy Ken Hackathorn, I just visited him not too long ago, and he has a good rule of thumb. You should be able to take the magazine, like an AR mag, and push it down, push the rounds down to where it covers up your thumbnail. And if you can push the rounds down to the point where it covers up your thumbnail, then you have the correct compression room to be able to seat the magazine with the bolt forward. That's why I teach 30 rounds. Um, and you'll notice a lot of the more modern AR mags, the polymer mags and different ones in the market are actually designed to take 30 rounds now and they'll have compression with 30 rounds in it. Uh, I still teach 28 kind of across the board because you still have to use the USGI aluminum magazine as the benchmark, the gold standard, because there's still more of those out there than all the others by far. Yeah, combined. So it has to be your benchmark, and I still teach 28 because of that. Um, if you're in a situation where you may be having to top off your weapon, like I don't have a pistol on me, I've got to top my gun off or whatever. Man, you got to be real careful or you will run into a situation where you, you'll think the mag's seated, but it's not. I see it. It's epidemic in my carbine classes. Generally within the first hour of a carbine class, it'll happen. So that's why I teach 28 instead of 30. I think we are hitting two hours. I think so too. I want to do a quick shout out to my friends at Blue Force Gear before we wrap it up. They have a limited edition sling here, AOR1 camo with CNC machined aluminum hardware that's hard code anodized. I guarantee you there is more money known Blue Force Gear, which is the Porsche of these gear manufacturers. I mean, they, they spare no expense on this stuff. It is top shelf. There's more money in that machine slider. It costs them more to make that than the than when you go into a gun shop and you buy it, than there is in the entire sling when you buy it. It's just the way they are. That slider on this limited edition sling is machined out of bar stock aluminum and then hard coat anodized. 
and now all the hardware is done that way. So limited edition sling, go to Blue Force Gear to check it out. It's a limited edition AOR one sling by Blue Force Gear and it's a Vicar sling and it's not gonna be many of them made. Cool, hope you guys enjoyed it. This is the first ever LAV Live episode. Thank you, Tyler Gray, for being here. Thank you for having me, Larry. It's been awesome. And thank everyone for asking questions and tuning in. Again, it's it's your time, and, and I mean, it's pretty awesome to sit here and get, uh, you know, at the end of the day, you're asking questions, and it's cool to get us to think about, you know, different answers. And, and it's, at the end of the day, look, we're, th this is this is our wheelhouse. This is what we like doing. This, this isn't just a job, it's a hobby. Mm -hmm. We love gear, we love guns. And we love talking about them. So thanks for taking the time to throw out the questions and uh, kind of generate our brains. Yeah, two hours for the first one. Yeah, we, it yeah. felt like it was, what, 20 minutes? <laughs> um, like I said, the, the goal is to do one of these a week. Um, I can tell you right off the bat with how I travel and stuff, that is going to be tough. But you will definitely follow my social media, my Facebook, Instagram, and whatnot. And I will announce well in advance when we're going to be doing it again. Cool. Have a good one. All right. Thanks, guys. Hey, thanks for watching the Vickers Tactical YouTube channel. To subscribe, click here. And to watch some of my favorite videos, click here. Have a good one. LAV out.